Hey, Credit Heroes! It's Daniel Rosen here, and I'm coming to you live from my, my hotel room here in Orlando, Florida. I'm actually here at the rock concert of marketing events. It's an event called Funnel Hacking Live, and it's been here in Orlando, Florida all week. And I had to come up here to my room because I needed to shoot this video, and it's just crazy downstairs. The energy is through the roof, and all week I've been hard at work with some of the best minds in the business, developing new tools and tactics to help you to run and grow your credit repair business. So while I'm out of town, I wanted to share an interview that I recently did with one of our most successful credit heroes. See, I had the honor of being one of the first guests on the Credit Repair Junkies podcast, which is hosted by our Millionaires Club member, Bruce Politano. See, Bruce and Keenan and I, we dove deep into what it takes to grow and scale a credit repair business all the way up to seven figures. And you know what? I'm gonna share that entire conversation with you right now on this podcast. So you better stick around. My name is Daniel Rosen and welcome to Credit Repair Business Secrets. Man, let's jump right into this thing. I wanna know, Daniel Keenan, Credit Repair Cloud, how long has it been that you guys have been in a credit repair space? Well, Credit Repair Cloud has been around for about 10 years, but I've been in the credit repair space about 10 years prior to that. So it's about 20 years. Really? Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a crazy story. When I was a kid, um, I didn't have a very good home life. I wasn't very good in school but I was really obsessed with juggling. I was so obsessed with juggling, it's all I would do, and I got really good at it, huh. which came in handy because when I was 13, I left home and I would juggle on street corners to make money to eat. I, I was homeless and that's how I made money to eat. Then I learned that if I could make people laugh, they'd put more money in my hat. I just kept obsessing and obsessing and getting better at this. And I started to have a little career in show business. My first gig off the streets, I was in the ice capades, <laughs> um, which was kind of weird. I wasn't an ice skater, but I went to the skating rink and said, I'd like to have ice skating lessons, please, because I'm going to be in the ice capades. That's they crazy. said, have you ever skated? I said, no. They thought I was crazy. <laughs> so I started practicing all that, got in the ice capades, realized that I didn't like that so much that I missed the comedy from the streets. Mm. So I decided I wanted to get really, really good at comedy. So I obsessed on that. I just obsess over things. Mm -hmm. And I worked in all kinds of crappy comedy clubs and all kinds of things, worked my way up till eventually I was doing shows like Johnny Carson and things like that. And I had a pretty long career in show business and on television. My last long time gig, I was the announcer of The Price is Right. Oh, no I was way. the guy who says, come on down, <laughs> that guy, and a new car. So cool. that a career, it looked like I was doing a lot, but a career in show business really means you're broke all the time. I, mm -hmm. I had big gigs, but then there were long, long gaps between them where I was always living on credit cards. Mm. And, you know, and you get those credit cards and then you get those things in the mail with those blank checks yeah and i'd use those to pay off uh to pay my rent and other things and 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 it just kept getting worse and worse and worse during the price is right that was my longest gig so i managed to buy this messed up little house mm. and it had no kitchen or bathroom for like nine months i was living there like i was camping Really? Uh, yeah, I pooed in uh, Home Depot bags <laughs> in the yard. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but I slowly, slowly fixed it up and again, racked up my credit cards. But I was so proud of that little house because I felt like I had finally really achieved something. But then one day, this bank error destroyed my credit overnight and all my bills shot up. And I was on break between shows again. Mm -hmm. And my bills doubled overnight. The error was I had both my first and second loan at the same bank. Mm -hmm. So big loan and then little HELOC loan. Some clerk there typed in the wrong thing. And so they were both the same amount. 
Oh. And that made me look hundreds of thousands of dollars over a revolving line of credit. Mm. So that sent up red flags. All my bills shot up. I didn't have the money. I almost lost my house. I almost went bankrupt. It was just horrible. It ruined my life. I called the bank and and they they said, sorry, we made a mistake. We'll fix it. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't fix that domino effect on all the other cards. Yeah. So it was months of letter writing and calling and this whole time, and I was pretty into computers. On the side, I would make websites for people, yeah. other other comedians and performers. So you yeah, started exactly. writing letters and everything. Exactly. And I realized I'm writing all these letters I'm because I was studying about credit repair and how it works. And I'm writing all these letters and making these calls and keeping track of everything. And I'm going, this is a lot of repetitive work. Mm -hmm. There's got to be software for this. And I started searching for it. Yeah. And there wasn't any. What year was I, this? This was early 2000s. Yeah. And I, there wasn't any. And I went, aha, I found my way out of show business. I'm going to create the world's first credit repair software. Yeah. But I didn't know anything about business. I, I don't have a degree in finance. I didn't even graduate high school. Mm -hmm. So I had to start learning how to code. And I kept trying to learn how to code. And it wasn't working. And eventually, but I kept drawing the software. So I drew it so many times. Like, do you remember the movie Close Encounters where the, the guy keeps drawing this mountain and he doesn't know why he's obsessed yeah. with it? That's yeah. how I was. I kept drawing this software that I wanted to build that I couldn't build mm -hmm. till eventually I figured out you hire somebody. Mm -hmm. And so by doing a gig here or there or making somebody a website or uh, whatever I could, I managed to pay for a developer to help me. And I made this little download <laughs> called Credit that. Aid. Yeah. I mean, I finally got this launched in about 2004. And um, it was $20. I sold a few, but nobody really cared. Uh, and uh, But that was me in the doctor suit. I was the credit doctor, see? I remember um, But it actually did what it was supposed to do. That still was existing in 2012, was it not? <laughs> oh, yeah. That, I remember that when I got in the credit industry in 2012, that's what I had. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, and for about t the, some people bought it, um, but it just it was it was so hard to get a customer. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get twenty dollars for this thing. And then I'd never see that person again. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I made a little bit bigger of a version for businesses. But still, yeah. it, that was the end of the sale. I didn't know. How to create a business from it a, a good week i could make a maybe a hundred dollars or a couple hundred yeah. dollars it was terrible but yeah. credit repair companies started wanting bigger versions mortgage brokers and realtors and people like that tax people mm -hmm. started wanting bigger versions and that's when i realized oh i've got to mm -hmm. make it for businesses yeah and it's got to be in order for it to really be a business and it's got to be in the cloud so that we can keep making it better. And um, and you so made then it for I consumers credit aid was for consumers for consumers so people like you was hey you know I got the runaround from the credit bureaus right there's this huge error and it's very repetitive work so yeah let me buy this little piece of software it'll help me not cramp my hands and get carpal tunnel from writing so many letters so that's exactly. what credit aid was for it's for the it's for the consumer right yeah it was exactly. like a DIY. Yeah. And in fact, I even it even got into stores. It was in a, a chain called Fry's. Oh, cool. um, but but uh, so I made thousands of them, but then Fry's never paid me. No, <laughs> so no. It was a disaster. Yeah. yeah, I ran TV commercials, but I it was just like flushing money away. I didn't know how advertising worked. Yeah. Um, so really, you've been in a credit for space then since the early 2000s in one way or another, yeah. especially oh, yeah. with credit aid. So then when did credit repair cloud? become a thing? When was Credit Repair Cloud initiated? And how was that transition from Credit Aid to Credit Repair Cloud? Well, the little bit of money I was making from this, I got this idea, but I knew it was going to be really expensive. Mm -hmm. And it was before people were even calling this the cloud, mm -hmm. uh, the internet. Um, yeah. But I got this idea and I, I started pitching to investors because I knew it was going to cost a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they all said no. So I just thought, okay, I'm not going to leave this room until I figure it out. Yeah. And I sat in a weird little sad room for about five years 
And I just worked on it. I mean, occasionally I'd leave to, if I like could paint someone's wall or watch yeah. someone's cat or do something <laughs> to get money to keep paying developers yeah. and slowly hobble this thing together. And I, I still didn't know how advertising worked. So I would just write articles all night until the sun came up. Mm. And that started to create a blog and and that started to bring traffic. And then after five or six years in this weird little room, I was able to launch Credit Repair Cloud. And because I'd written all the articles, people started coming and it started getting a little tra traffic and um, yeah. traction. Yeah. And then the first year or so, I was doing everything. I thought it'd be easy once there were customers. Yeah. Uh, but suddenly I was dealing with people too. And that was really hard. I'd never done that. I, yeah. on the early website, you, you'd probably remember Tammy. I had little pictures on the site of the people I was pretending to be. Yeah, I was still on sales. I was Tammy on support. Everyone yeah. hated Tammy. Tammy was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just horrible trying to get this thing going, but yeah. little by little it started to grow. But I, I wasn't getting any sleep and it was very stressful. At one point I gained almost a hundred pounds wow. from the stress. Yeah. And that's when Keenan came into the picture. That's what I was going to ask. Like, yeah, Keenan had to come in somehow. How, how did that happen? And what was that like? Well, there was this Google had this thing. It was really cool, but they only promoted it on one day. It was called Google Helpouts. Can mm. you describe what that was? Yeah, it was a, at the time, it was a platform where you could learn from a variety of experts online. So if you wanted to learn to cook or uh -huh. hire a lawyer or uh, get IT support, you could basically pay someone by the minute kind of over like a kind of like what we're doing now, like over a Zoom call. Yeah. And, um, and you get someone's expert help. Yeah. And so I thought, this is far out. I want to try this. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, what do I need help with? And I just bought my first Mac because I'd been oh. doing Windows <laughs> oh, yeah. for years and years and years. And I thought, okay, I have this weird question about formatting bullet notes yeah. in, or bullet bullets in, a, in an email. Yeah. And uh, I'll find somebody who can help me. And I kept seeing all these IT people. And then there was this kid that I kept seeing. And it was Keenan in a, in a little suit and tie. Yeah. And he and my girlfriend's in the yeah. other room. Grace is in there saying, hey, what are you doing? Aren't we going to watch a show? <laughs> and I'm going, no, I got to meet Keenan. I found Keenan's <laughs> resume. And it said he I, I, I figured out he was in high school. So I thought he was about 17. And his yeah. resume said he'd been doing IT support for 10 years, uh. meaning he started at seven. Yeah. <laughs> so she's going, can we watch a show? And I'm going, no, I got to meet Keenan. And yeah. then five minutes later, I he was uh four dollars and ninety-five cents for 15 minutes. Oh and I paid the four ninety-five, and then we're I'm face to face with Keenan, and he solved my problem in less than a minute. Mm. And and I said, Hey, I paid you for 15 minutes. We still got 14 left. So I want to <laughs> tell you about my company because I want you to work for me. Uh -huh. And so Keenan was the first employee. That's and, awesome. <laughs> and yeah, and then he started giving me advice and I'm going, why is this kid giving me advice? <laughs> but months later, when I started following the advice, we started doing a lot better as a business and we started to grow. Mm. Most of Keenan's advice was hire more people. Yeah. So that's what we started. So this, we here you out. are, you built this software, but yeah. you can't figure out bullets in an email on a Mac. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like I can build software, but I can't do bullets on a Mac. Right. Give me my windows back. So you meet Keenan for four ninety five, dollars Right. And boom, marriage made in heaven. And this yeah. was how long? 10 years ago, I'm, I guess. That, nine and a half, 10 years ago. Yeah. Keenan, how old are you then? <laughs> I think, yeah, somewhere around 18 at the time. Wow. <laughs> look at that. Yeah. And what has that been like for you? Like, what was that experience like for you to come into what Daniel had just started out and then kind of be able to not only, you know, give your input, but see how your input helped develop what Credit Repair Cloud is today? Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, the whole experience was a lot of fun. I mean, I've been always been into tech and mm -hmm. I've and always been kind of an entrepreneur at heart growing up. Like I was like 
some I think Daniel and I have a lot of similarities with some of our early stories of like mm-hmm. like he's hustling doing people's websites like yeah in the wall like I was in high school like yeah doing video editing for people building people's websites to, yeah uh, running around in my car to different people's houses to do IT support and uh, always like freelancing with a ton mm-hmm. of entrepreneurial stuff yeah so then it just it gave me a vehicle to do it in a business and yeah. um. And yeah, started giving a bunch of advice on like marketing in the early days. Mm-hmm. What came in doing support, then yeah. grew into marketing, and now a uh, product, the company. That's that's awesome. I have a similar story too. Like I left uh, my parents' house when I was fifteen, and I was hustling too. But when your back is pushed against the wall and you have no choice but to succeed, the only thing you can do is succeed, right? Um, yeah. My, my wife we, and I we, we talk about no this all the time, now. and we you know I wonder what kind of person. I would have become if I didn't have those things happen to me early on in my life. Would I even be where I am today doing the things that I am doing today, right? Would I have the little bit of success that I have today if it weren't for all those circumstances? Because I feel like I'm a product of all of that. And I think you guys could probably share the same things. Like if you weren't juggling in the, in the middle of the street at 13, credit per cloud probably wouldn't be here, right? No, exactly. Some things just have to happen in life in order to kind of push you through you know, beyond your limits. And that's where you really build big things. So that's, that's awesome. That's an awesome story. Um, with, within credit repair cloud, was there ever a plan B? Like you knew then that you were going to do this credit aid and then you started seeing the demand that people needed a bigger version of it. Companies needed a bigger version of it. Was ever, was there ever a thought like, man, maybe I shouldn't do this. I should go into doing something else instead. Or were you always like all in to this one thing and why? Uh, All in because I become obsessed about things. Mm. And I mean, during that time when I was in that weird little room, obsessing about trying to build this, I also wasn't sleeping much. I wasn't showering, (laughs) brushing my teeth. I was just focused. And and I get, I mean, now I've learned to have a morning routine where I actually do bathe and brush my teeth. Oh, thank God. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, things got pretty unbalanced. And I think to do anything big, you have to go unbalanced. Mm -hmm. I know I was just so obsessed for it to succeed. And then when Keenan came on on board and started saying, we got to hire more, we just kept, as we grew, actually, we'd hire more people and then the business would grow. Mm -hmm. It was sort of backwards. Yeah. But uh, but that's how it worked. Even Keenan, at the very beginning, said, okay, how much money do you want? It was $500 a month. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh my God, that's so much money. How am I ever going to afford that? Yeah. But I figured it out. Yeah. And then if that was the beginning. It was very, very meager beginnings. Um, but we we kept hiring hard. Now we have over 100 people. That's it's crazy. pretty amazing. So we can do really cool stuff. Yeah. We're building all kinds of cool stuff for the future. We're getting into AI and all kinds of wild things are coming. Yeah. That's it's awesome. Fun. You know, it, it's it's cool to see because I don't want to knock anybody out who didn't have hardships in life but are successful, right? There, I'm, there's a way to success without hardships, right? You don't, and you also don't have to be a trust fund baby to have success either, right? There's there's there is a happy medium. Really, all you need to do is you need to work hard. So you can have a good life, right? A, a loving home with two parents, and you know, graduate high school with a four GPA, and you know, be you know. All these wonderful things, but that's not what makes somebody successful. What makes somebody successful is their work ethic. If you have a strong work ethic, that's really what it takes, where you obsess and you don't give up until you're done, right? Exactly. So it's not to knock anybody out who didn't have hardships like the three of us did and found success, but I feel like when you have hardships, you don't have any other choice other than to have a a strong work ethic or else you don't survive. How are you going to eat? Like if you weren't juggling, you weren't going to make a few bucks to go get a dollar menu burger from McDonald's, right? Exactly. Like, I don't remember that. Like I used to get $3 a day so I can have three double cheeseburgers from McDonald's. Like I remember that like it was yesterday, you know? And it was, if you don't have the work ethic, you're not going to make the $3, you know? So I feel like, you know, for anybody listening to the show who's interested in starting a credit repair company, or maybe you already started your credit repair company, but you don't, you haven't found the success that you're trying to, to achieve yet. It's it has all to do with your work ethic. I'm not knocking your work ethic, just work harder, right? Like it's exactly. not if you're if you didn't have a dollar to feed your family next week, would you be working as hard as you are today or would you work a little bit harder? And if you have that mindset, that framework, you really could bootstrap your business to the next level. Sure. 
And the but the important thing is to learn from your mistakes and make little adjustments. Yeah. When I was doing this, it wasn't working, and I kept like trying and trying and trying the same thing, and it was failing and failing. Um, but now, what finally grew the company was making mistakes and learning from them and pivoting. And 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 I see our 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 customers, yeah. many CROs when they're just getting started, they're they're afraid to go live on. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, Facebook Live and all that stuff. And yeah. uh, they're afraid to put things out there for their friends and family to see. And yeah. and so they don't get customers. You don't go all into it. It's not going to go all in for you. The the failure is a good thing is if you're failing forward. Fail forward, yeah. right? If you fail and that defeats you, then fail failure wins, right? Yeah. Failure loses every time when you fail forward and you use failure as a stepping stone to get to the next thing, right? So yeah. if you fail, that's okay. It's normal. You know, success is on the other side of failure, Absolutely. right? You can avoid failure on your way to success. You're going to fail a few times before you find success. And even when you do find success, you're still going to fail, you know? Again and so, again and again, thousands and, of times. And that's how you do it. Failing upwards. Failing, exactly. Failing upwards, failing forward. If you had to say, right, it's been 20 years, right? Almost credit repair cloud has been around or in the credit repair space that you guys, that you've been involved in. If you each had to say one thing that you know now, that you wish you knew when you first started Credit Repair Cloud, when Kino was already in the picture and you guys were working together. Daniel, for you, what is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew then that could have like made a world of a difference for you guys? And then Keenan, I'll ask you the same question. Getting help, growing a team, finding mentors. And another big one, when I was doing this, uh, my girlfriend, Grace, kept saying, you should go out and meet other other businesses mm -hmm. and get their advice. And I was like, I know everything. Nobody's <laughs> going to understand my business. Yeah. And, yeah. and it kept failing. Now we're, we get in mastermind programs. We've got mentors. We've got, we do networking. We're meeting lots and lots of people in, in many kinds of businesses. Really all businesses are the same. Yeah. Um, if, but it's really important. So I if, wish I had done all that. You hear eight figure businesses or nine figure businesses talk about, I have mentors, I network, I get in masterminds. What makes you think that your six figure business doesn't need that? It's like, if my eight figure business, your eight, nine figure business needs that, what makes you think that those don't, right? And people are so afraid of asking for help. And I, I didn't, my business didn't boom until I went out and I asked for help because I, I, and I have a hard time delegating. Like I'm a control freak. I feel like if I want something done right, I got to do it myself. No one is going to do it as good as me. The problem with that is I'm limited to just my own capabilities, right? Sure. And then I'm only limited to what I know and what I don't know hurts me every single time. So I had to go out. I had to find a mentor. My mentor is Ty Crandall, right? Oh, I've been working with Ty for, Ty. I don't know, five years now. What did Ty do? Ty had a credit for business. He built it. He sold it. And now he runs Credit Suite, you know, multi eight figure business. Like, hmm, this guy's been where I'm trying to go. How about I try to reach out to him and follow his footsteps. Until this day, like clockwork, Ty and I meet every week. And I don't like, I can be in Italy on vacation with my family or he can be in skiing somewhere and we're still finding a way to meet because it's important to me. It's important to him. And it just, it when you have help, you get forward faster. So the fact that you said that coming from a company at the size of Credit Repair Cloud, like I hope that the, the people who are listening or watching this can understand and realize the importance of seeking help from people who are further ahead. Because there's plenty of us willing to lay a hand back, right? Like if you had a software company, maybe not in the credit repair space, but in other spaces, and they're just getting started with their software company, I'm sure you'd be more than happy and willing to lay a hand, to give some advice, to be a sounding board, because you have those people for you. Exactly. Right? It's only lonely at the top if you get there by yourself. All right. So how many people can you bring up? Keenan, for you, what was, you know, the one thing that you wish you knew then that you know now mm -hmm. that would have made a world of a difference for you guys' organization? Well, before I go into my first item, just something tactical from um, Daniel's advice of just hiring and getting people to help. Yeah. Like one of our mentors, Dan Martell, he's in the software world, but he just wrote a book recently called Buy Back Your Time mm -hmm. that um, it's all about getting help. And but very tactically, you don't have to run a software company. It could be, it's actually very tactical for any business. Um, yeah. And it, it teaches you the right mindsets and right processes to 
to get you out of the business and yeah. get you into building the business. That's important. Very important. Yeah. yeah. I think the the biggest thing that I wish I would have knew to be known at the beginning and know now is to uh model success in general. Like go up go out there who's who's one step ahead of us and go model them that mm -hmm. and um it doesn't have to be expensive. Like I think in the early days we were buying some books, buying some courses. Yeah. Um, you know, you're now a fan of click funnels. So we were buying some, uh, but like to get better at marketing, we bought yeah. a bunch of, uh, Russell Brunson's books of, uh, the founder of click funnels mm -hmm. and learned a lot about marketing. Um, and those books can be like 20 bucks to buy. It's yeah. not, you don't have to invest a ton. And then we we're able to model, uh, what they were doing successfully. And then, um, and then over time we were able to hire more expensive mentors, get into masterminds, get into bigger business groups. And yeah. then we were able to start modeling the success of others. And instead of doing like the tactics of marketing and sales and building product, now it's more leadership and yeah. learning from other companies to <laughs> how do we delegate more? How do we, uh, uh, how do we become better leaders? Um, yeah, but the investments have come more over time. So you can you could start smaller. It does again, you don't have to get into a really yeah. expensive mastermind at the beginning. We started with just some books, some courses, and grew from there. So and, model and success. People, don't exactly. reinvent the wheel. Exactly. Like if you, somebody already has a wheel working, why are you going to reinvent it and make it square, right? <laughs> and also, even if you don't have money for a mastermind, just every city has a, a local. Uh, business networking yeah. group and it meet plumbers and electricians and their business is the same as yours. They have to get clients the same way. Yeah. And then they can probably send you clients and all so many of those things are free. Yeah, that's true. A lot of, yeah. um, you know, a mistake that I see um, entrepreneurs make, especially in our industry, right? In the credit repair space is as credit repair business owners, right? As CROs, we sometimes obsess with the idea of doing credit repair more than with the fact that you own a credit repair business. Yes, it's important that you know how to do credit repair because that's what people are paying you for. That's your product. That's your service. You need to know that. But more important than that is knowing all that is useless if you don't have a business, right? So knowing business is more important than knowing the service or the product. So you need to be able to remove yourself from the day-to-day -day as soon as possible so that you can grow your business and you can teach somebody the day-to-day, -day, right? You can hire, you can do all these things because no one is going to go out there and grow your business. You can find a bunch of people to write dispute letters. You could. You can find a bunch of people to, to talk to customers on the phone. You're not going to find people who are going to go out and grow your business for you. Only you can do that, right? So right. to Keenan's point, you know, don't reinvent the wheel, find help, mentor, uh, not mentor, model success, model what's working. Let's look at successful credit repair companies. Are their owners, are their CEOs writing dispute letters? Or what are they doing? Model what they're doing, right? I think that for you, um, Daniel, in particular, when did you get to the point where you kind of removed yourself from being CRC creator hands-on to moving the business, moving the vision forward? That was hard. That was really hard because it meant letting go of everything because I was doing everything. I was in everybody's business. Yeah. I was in support tickets. I still get still CC'd in Tammy. every email that comes to my company because I just can't let go. But yes, I get that. It's hard. Yeah. And but I was we were in this program with this guy named Alex Sharfin. Mm -hmm. His company is now called Simple Operations. In fact, his he taught us how to create the organization how how communication works goals meetings mm -hmm. all the, the things that became the operating system of our business and the big goal of his program is to get into what he calls running your business from the passenger seat mm -hmm. and that means handing everything off and that freaked me out i couldn't do it but uh, <laughs> keenan would catch me in support tickets and say get out of there <laughs> other people i was i was micromanaging but I was doing so much and under so much stress. One day I just surrendered and let go. And it was scary. It was very scary. And I actually went through about six months 
where I was depressed and I didn't know what to do because I was so used to putting out fires all day long. And I'd come in here to work and I'd be playing on Facebook so that Keenan in the next office would think that I was working. (laughs) But I wasn't. I didn't know what to do. But gradually, it opened up space to where suddenly I could live in the future. Mm -hmm. And I could live in the future of of what we want to do as a company. And the other thing, once I handed everything off, and got ever out of everyone's way, the, the business grew a lot faster. And now Keenan's going through that. Tell me that. Yeah, let's talk about that, Keenan. How how's that experience? <laughs> it's a challenging experience for anyone to go through. I mean, I I mean I started with the company in support, had to work my way out of that into marketing, and then work my way more out of that to get into product. And now I'm actually or hiring people under me to work my way um at a higher so I can get to a higher level of the product side of the yeah. business. It is really hard to let go, but there's uh but it's the only way to grow the business because you you become right? a bottleneck <laughs> yeah. for it. If you want to grow the business, you um you have to do it. There's like a reason that um if you look at lots of s- small and medium businesses in like your city, like you go to like a plumber, a mm-hmm. dentist, uh all those kind of small businesses in your mm-hmm. city, there's there's a reason that that most of them get to like a million, two million a year and then cap at that because mm-hmm. they just can't out outgrow their uh their ability to delegate uh what they're doing in their own time. I know like we've, what you said, we've gotten you a lot became the bottleneck of the business. Like you yourself, your position becomes mm-hmm. the bottleneck of the oh, business. Yeah, because he knows so much. <laughs> yeah. He knows so much everyone's coming to him for every department. Yeah. And we all call him young Yoda. <laughs> so yeah. 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 But That's- mentors have helped a lot. A lot of management books that that say this where you if you feel like you're having a challenge where you're spending way too much time in the business and not on it to grow it, like just spend two weeks documenting your time, 15 yeah. minute increments on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? What are you doing? It makes you realize where you're spending all of your time. And then you can analyze that and be like, I just spent uh, one week on marketing. Yeah, <laughs> I need to hire someone in to replace me in that. That's one way to start getting out of the day to day. And it's easier said than done, right? Because like you, it's your baby. Like you, what it is today, you created it from nothing. Like you birthed this thing, and then for you to just hand it off to somebody who, for sure, is not going to care as much about it as you do. Well, they don't have to. They just have to care enough to keep moving it forward. Right. It's hard for my wife and I to go out on dates because we don't let strangers watch our kids. Like if my parents aren't watching my kids or or my my sister-in-law is not watching my kids, we're not going anywhere because I'm not going to leave my babies with people who I don't know, or I don't trust that are going to even keep them alive. And our business is the same way. So delegating is so difficult. And Daniel, you said your business really started growing when you started doing those things. And that's that's the truth for every business. That's why the plumbers and the, the dentist office, they don't they grow to one, two million, and they're done because who else is gonna be the dentist? Who else is gonna be the plumber? Like you become the bottleneck of your business. For me, I hired a 17-year-old kid too. His name is Rob. He runs Fred Repair Junkies today. Um, he was scooping ice cream. And we met at church and students a ministry. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm looking for, you know, somebody to help me out. And he would come into my third bedroom in my apartment. And we used to print letters and fold letters together way back in the day. Until I had Rob, my business couldn't grow because I had to be stuck in there. Then when Rob came along and he became the Bruce of that time, the new Bruce had time to go out and do other things, right? And now we have Danny who have, was fresh here from Columbia, needed a job. He now runs my entire credit likes credit repair company. And if it wasn't for Daniel, we wouldn't be where we are today in our own credit repair company because I can't handle everything by myself. So it's important to know like if you're, if you're just getting started now or you're thinking about starting a credit repair company, one of the things that you need to realize they need to do sooner than later is get yourself out of the day-to-day operations as soon as possible. Right. How soon would you guys say, Daniel, how soon do you remove yourself from day to day operations? Well, I think you need to learn your craft first. Mm -hmm. And um, but then as soon as you know your craft and you've got some customers, yeah, start finding help because you can't manage what you don't know. Right. Right. Like, how can you hire somebody to come out and do your customer service or your sales if you don't even know how to do customer service and sales yourself? How can you hire somebody to come do your your disputes? or manage somebody to do your disputes, even if it's a company like mine with 11 years of experience, how can you manage us if you don't even know how to do it? Like, how can you hold us accountable if you don't even know it? 
you're going to literally be at our mercy. I mean, you could, you're safe, right? But as a business owner, is that necessarily the smartest choice to make? So I agree with you. Learn your craft first, but that doesn't mean that to learn it, you have to do it for a year. No, but you have to do it long enough to document it. Yes. And write the SOPs. The SOPs. Otherwise, when you hire somebody, they're not going to know what to do. And it's going to be, and it's SOPs are just easier to train, right? You plug somebody into your SOP, right? Your standard operating procedure. And then now you have a, a framework to train somebody. And now you can hire as many people as you want and just plug them into that SOP. If you don't have an SOP, then every time you hire somebody, you got to take time away from doing what you're doing to go and do manually what the SOP can just automate in your business, right? Exactly. Credit per cloud has a lot of SOPs, huh? <laughs> Probably over a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and who puts all those together? <laughs> Keenan put a lot together. Well, at the start, it's, I mean, when, if you're trying to get something off your plate, it's, I mean, sometimes it can start by just that person documenting the processes. For example, in the early days I was doing support and then I would document a few things that process of how I would do support and then hand that to that person. And then um, yeah. start doing that with product. Here's the process of how we're going to build product and then mm -hmm. hand it over to a team member. I mean, you could do that simply just by getting an app like Loom or another yeah. and forward your screen, just go through the process that you're doing on a daily basis, like for the 15 minute video. This is how I do this process. This is how we book people for the podcast. This is how we how we should do this type of support ticket hand it over to them. And th that's one way of starting to delegate that. And mm -hmm. now it's, I mean, now we have teams with members under them and members under them. So yeah. they're all creating the processes. It, we have to teach these same think. techniques to those team members to, to help them yeah. create the processes for their departments. Yeah. A lot of people have analysis paralysis when it comes to building SOPs. And it's literally as easy as recording yourself doing that thing. Even if it's not your screen, if it's a manual process, turn your iPhone camera on, put it in selfie mode and record yourself doing it. And then when you hire somebody here, watch this video. This is how I do it, right? And watch this video. This is my screen of me doing that whole thing. It's easier than you think. You don't need analysis prep. You don't need to create this whole Google doc with 30 bullet points. You know, Keenan can help people do bullet points on Mac if you guys need help, but uh, <laughs> it's not that difficult. Right. You just record yourself doing it. So yeah, don't, don't have yeah. analysis paralysis. <laughs> and these are the things that really grow a business. Mm -hmm. Yep. You got to have a concise way of doing things. Right. And then a lot of times when you build an SOP, while you're building the SOP, you can come up with a more efficient way of doing it just because you're documenting it. And you're like, yeah. man, why do I do it that way? It's so counterproductive. If I just did it like this instead, it would be so much easier. Just because you're building the SOPs, you start realizing those things. Right. That's awesome. A couple more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. What's next for, for Credit Repair Cloud? What's next? We got a lot on our plate. I mean, a few things coming down the line. We're, we're working our way into AI and we've got some big things coming in that direction. And um, we're working on a lot of things that um, as a new CRO, you need um, often a lot of people in this coming into the industry um, need help with marketing and sales and getting, getting yep. leads into their business. Yep. So working on ways to make that even easier. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's, you know, I, I try to serve my industry. That's, you know, I live to serve, you know, servant leadership for me is, is a real thing. And, you know, working with as many CROs as we do, we realize that the biggest problem that, that CROs have is getting customers, right? So July 10th, we're running our first uh, CRO boot camp. And we're doing 100 clients in 100 days. Boom, guaranteed. And if you don't get 100 clients in 100 days, I'll personally work with you one-on-one -on -one for free until you do. Because I'm sick and tired of seeing CROs struggle to get customers. That's Getting leads is the easy part. You can throw a rock and you hit somebody with back credit. Finding people with back credit is not hard. The difficulty comes in having a sales process to convert those leads into paying customers and having a structured business that can support that growth, right? So yeah. people come into the industry thinking it's as easy as making you know a few Facebook posts and then you get one of the, the millionaire plaques. Yeah, it's not, not necessarily. You get there. But you got to have processes. You got to have SOPs. You have to remove yourself from the day-to-day -day operations. You are the bottleneck. You know, so we're running this bootcamp. We're going to start helping a lot of people because I want the industry to succeed. I want people to come into the industry and stay, right? I don't want you to come into the industry, stay for three to six months, not be able to succeed and then quit and go back to your nine to five. Like that's not, that's not the life that anybody wants. When you want to start a credit repair business to help people, well, then let's get there. You know, so it's awesome that you guys have that same mission of helping people, you know, coming up, marketing and sales and, and teach people how to get customers because what, what else are you in business for? How are you going to change a whole lot of lives if you can get lives to change, 
right? So exactly. it's it's cool to see that we share that same vision and that same mission to to help um, CROs up and running. Daniel, for you, what is long term goal for Credit Repair Cloud? You know, five years, maybe even ten years from now, long term. What do you see as a visionary of the of the company? We're building something that is going to bring CROs lots and lots and lots of clients. We've got this big giant thing. I can't really talk about it, but it's really exciting. Love the cliffhanger. Uh, it's going to take us some time to build it, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to bring lots and lots and lots of clients. This is your long-term vision for CRC. It's a long-term vision. That's yeah. great. Yeah, whatever you guys put out, it, it's, you know, you have that heart of serving as well. You know, and that's why companies who are in it just for money, they fail. They fail. And with you guys do your best with what you have to be able to help as many people as you can. And we, you know, a lot of you're appreciated by many. That's for sure. That's so yeah, nice to hear. I mean, it's sure. really, we really care about the businesses on our platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little more about the future too. I mean, I think we see that a lot of consumers don't even realize how how to get to their financial goals. They don't realize they can buy a house or they don't even realize that that they're paying a, a crazy amount on their loan. So mm -hmm. we have some big ambitions to to really help help more people get to mm -hmm. their financial goals. Educating them. Millions of people. Awesome. That's exciting. Can't wait to see it unfold. All right, so let's wrap up. I'll let you guys put me on the spot. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, now's the time. <laughs> You're exposed to so many business owners um you're just men mentioning you i mean you i'm sure you've worked with thousands tens of thousands of people in the industry over over the years like mm -hmm. what do you wish they knew mm -hmm. um in the industry to help them succeed to, like what do you wish they knew prior to getting into the industry i wish they knew it wasn't so easy i wish they knew that it's not as easy as you may think like anything in life it's not all rainbows and unicorns Right. Like you're going to have hurdles, you're going to have adversities, you're going to have difficulties. And the only way you get through those things is if your why you're doing it is strong enough. The success is on the other side of the adversity or the failures of the uncomfortable. Right. You don't trip and fall on success. Success is intentional. Right. It's not accidental. So it's not going to be easy. Building anything that's worth anything isn't easy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's easy to get started. Very easy. You get a laptop, you get a cell phone, you get started. But you're not doing this just so you can get started. So building a credit repair company, running a credit repair company isn't easy. It's not, it's no easier than running anything else, right? It's not like, oh, I'm going to do a credit repair business instead of X, Y, Z, because it's going to be so much easier. That's you, that's a lie that you're telling yourself. And I wish a lot of most people knew that if you can go back and, you know, if I can know something myself is that, man, it ain't going to be as easy as it's cut out to, as it's made seem to be, you know, and we do a good job getting people into the industry, but we have to do a better job helping them succeed and not just get in just to get out six months, 12 months later, you know? So that's my mission. Like, that's why this whole boot camp thing is, man, if I can help you get a hundred clients in a hundred days, and I can show you that you have what it takes to make it into the industry. And if you can't get a hundred clients in a hundred days, it ain't because of me, it's because of you. It's because you didn't put in the work you didn't put in. And, I, and, and it's a boot camp. I'm calling it a boot camp because it's intentional. You think about military boot camp, right? What is a framework? What is a mind phrase? Like no excuses. I don't care. Just get it done. I don't care if it's snowing. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's 200 degrees outside. I don't care if you're dehydrated. I don't want to hear it until you're done. Right. And that's the framework that I'm bringing into this thing that we're doing, because I need people to know that it's not easy. Like it's not, it's easy to start. Yeah. Go ahead. File your LLC, get your computer, get your laptop. Boom. Easy to start. But now what are you going to do with it? How do we grow this thing? How do we really make this a real thing? It's not easy. And that's what I wish, Kenya, to answer your question that most people would know, is that starting a credit repair company, yeah, it's easy. Building it, running it, managing it, not as easy as you may think it is. So mm -hmm. that I think that hopefully answers your question. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Do you, cool. do you um, see any changes in the industry around marketing? That what's What are the tactics that are working to bring in those clients? I mean, you're right in the trenches with, thousands of companies. The name uh, of the game is the eyeballs. The name of the game is eyeballs. The more eyeballs you get on your business, the more clients you'll have, right? You can't have a hundred clients if a hundred people don't even know we do credit repair. That's impossible. It's literally impossible, right? So yeah, you're afraid of posting on your social media because you don't know what your third cousin is going to think of you. It's like, yeah, good luck. You're not going to grow your business further than your third cousin, <laughs> right? So yeah, the more, the name of the game is eyeballs. So how can you get more eyeballs in your business? 
effectively, right? Because you have an effectiveness or something. Like you think about why is it social media? Because that's where all the eyeballs are, right? You can go to networking events and be in I meetings. That's all great and dandy, but you get 20 eyeballs for the hour and a half that you're there, right? I can spend an hour and a half going live on Facebook and that's going to live forever on Facebook. It's going to give me a lot more than 20 eyeballs in a week, right? Or even in a day. So the name of the game is eyeballs. When it comes to marketing for credit repair, it's eyeballs. You can literally, again, throw a rock and you hit somebody with back credit. Two people that are watching have great credit. The other eight need your help. So how often are you getting in front of them? How often are those eyeballs, those same eyeballs seeing you? And that's only built with consistency. You have to become an authority in your space. There's plenty of people with back credit, enough for all of us to eat and do, make a really great living with it, right? I have a company five miles away from me. We can both make a whole lot of money and serve a whole lot of people. We're not stealing business from each other because there's more than enough for everybody to go around. And people are scared that, oh, but you know, there are other companies around me. And like, no, it doesn't matter. There's enough eyeballs. Like just capture more eyeballs. So to answer your question, Kenan, when it comes to marketing trends, it, it, it's no trends. It's just where are all the eyeballs congregating nowadays? You know, why do we go to mortgage brokers? Because if you go to, to Russell Brunson's book, you know, where are your dream clients congregating? Where is the pond that you can throw your hook? Where do your client, dream clients already live? Applying for mortgages. And where is that pond? At the mortgage broker's office. So why aren't you there? Your dream clients are there. Why aren't you there? Right? I built my first credit repair company. It's over 7,000 clients in one little pond, just the mortgage broker pond. You know, like it's, you got to be where your clients are. You need to have the eyeballs. And if you have the eyeballs, you'll get the business. Point blank. No questions or ifs or ands about it. Every time we see you, it's just, you are so smart about this stuff. It's just amazing to just watch you. I've just always mesmerized listening to you. I appreciate it. I'm really passionate about this, just like you guys are. Like, this yeah. is my livelihood. This is how I put food on my table, right? Again, yeah, the money is great, but that's not why I'm in it. People who know me on a little bit deeper level than just, oh, I use your product, I use your service, they can, they can vouch for that, right? You guys can vouch for that, where for me, it's really about the people. It's about serving. How can I help you get to the top? Because it is lonely at the top. I don't want to be there by myself. Let me let's let's help bring more people up. You exactly. Know? Thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart for taking your time. I know you guys are very busy, so I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me for this episode. And I can't wait to see you know what else happens next for for all of us in the space. Thank you again so much for your time. Wasn't that great? Bruce Palatano is amazing. And if you'd like to hear even more, check out my interview with him behind the scenes of a million dollar credit repair business. So take care, Credit Hero, and keep changing lives.